Senior Plasma Physics, Lecture 3. Quite often we're not concerned with the details of the circular motion of the particles. We just want to know where it's moving to. The pathway that indicates this motion is quite often referred to as the guiding center. If we introduce an electric field, as well as a magnetic field, we'll find that on top of the particle's curved motion, there is an average velocity in a particular direction. This is called E cross P drift. We won't limit our discussion for drifts arising from the presence of an electric force. Any force in combination with an applied magnetic field will cause drift. Finally, we'll examine the motion of a charged particle in the presence of a non-uniform magnetic field. Last lecture, we looked at the motion of a charged particle in a magnetic field. In this case, the magnetic field was out of the page, which we chose to be the z direction. And we were able to analyze the motion in terms of the parameters of circular motion. So what we're looking at here is the cyclotron motion of the particle in the xy plane, that is the plane of the page. But if we change our perspective such that the magnetic field is along the page, then we start to see a combination of the circular motion of the particle and the particle's motion in the z direction, such that it forms a helix. Now the center of that motion is called the guiding center. Quite often, that's the pathway we're interested in. We now look at a situation whereby the electric and the magnetic fields are assumed to be non-zero and they could be at any angle with respect to each other. Last time we looked at the situation where the electric field was zero, which was quite a simple situation. But now having a non-zero electric field component complicates things. Nevertheless, we still need to solve the Lorenz equation for the velocity v. This is a first order linear differential equation. Now in all linear differential equations, one really has to solve two differential equations. The first is known as the particular solution, whereby we substitute in the particular vectors for the electric and magnetic fields, and then go through the motions of solving for V. As we did last lecture, however now, the problem is much more complicated. The second differential equation one needs to solve is known as the complementary solution, or the homogeneous or homogeneous solution. This is where the right hand side is equated to zero. So the full solution becomes a superposition of the particular solution V1 and the complementary solution V2. You can see that V1 is going to be explicitly time dependent and most likely the motion will be quite complicated. Although under some circumstances this complicated motion may be of interest. In general, we really just want to know about the average motion of the particle. You can see that the complementary solution is constant because the differential equation is equated to a zero. This is the drift velocity and it's the one we're interested in since it tells us the average movement of our particles. We can solve for the drift velocity by equating the right hand side of the Lorenz equation to zero because it's part of the homogeneous equation. Let's relabel the drift velocity v2 into ve just to be consistent with the textbook. Now rearrange the equation. To make further progress we do a little trick. We take the cross product of both sides with the magnetic field vector b. In order to make further progress we have to make use of one of the many vector identities. You can find these in any vector calculus book. So you'll see that the cross product of A cross B cross C, by the way B here is not the magnetic field, it's just a vector B, is equal to the expression given on the right hand side. This can be proved, but we won't do it here, so please refer to your vector calculus book. Let's now apply the vector identity we obtain the following. Now look carefully at the right hand expression on the right hand side. V dot B is a scalar. So what we're left with is 
a vector along B. Now if you look at the left hand side of the equation, B cannot possibly be in the same direction as E cross B. So the only thing that remains is that B, the magnetic field vector, can possibly be in the same direction as the drift velocity VE. But if we make that substitution, you'll find that the problem becomes basically trivial. Everything goes to zero. So we assume that V is not in general in the same direction as B. So we can say that the right hand expression on the right hand side must be zero. Now let's rearrange the remaining terms. We end up with this expression for the drift velocity VE. Note that if E, the electric field, was at right angles to the magnetic field, then the expression becomes very simple. The drift velocity becomes the ratio of the electric and magnetic field strengths. Let's now consider the case where the electric and magnetic fields are at right angles to each other. We'd like to obtain a graphical representation of the motion rather than solving the Lorenz equation explicitly. We start with the magnetic field out of the page and the electric field at right angles to it. We introduce an ion with a velocity in the plane of the page. From the E cross B drift velocity formula, in this case the ion has to drift to the right. From the E cross B drift formula, we note that the ion has a net drift velocity, while other parts of the motion will follow a cycloid curve. You can justify this graphical representation of the motion by a thought experiment. The electric field will accelerate the particle upwards, but at the same time the magnetic field will try to rotate the particle. So at this point the particle is at its fastest and therefore its radius of gyration is largest. Similarly when it turns around it's traveling in the opposite direction to the electric field so it slows down. In doing so its radius of gyration becomes smaller. So you can kind of see how these two combined motions can result in this type of cycloid motion. We can give the same arguments in order to obtain a graphical representation of an electron introduced in the same way. Note that both drifts are in the same direction regardless of the charge of the particles. In this case the drifts are to the right and the drift velocity is given by the ratio of the electric to the magnetic field strengths. So let's summarize two properties of the drift velocity. The first is that both ions and electrons drift in the same direction regardless of their charge which is quite a notable feature of E cross B drift. The second is that the drift speed is the same regardless of the mass or the charge of the particle. That's not altogether intuitive. Graphically the two particles undergo in this case cycloid motion where the electric and magnetic fields are at right angles to each other and they have a guiding center drift velocity downwards in this case. Drift not only occurs due to an electric force in the presence of a magnetic field but can also occur in the presence of other forces. So let's obtain an equation that has a general expression for the force in the drift velocity formula. We do this by replacing the electric force QE with a general expression for the force F in the Lorenz equation. Following the same procedure as we did for the electric force, we can obtain an expression for the general force F which leads to the following general form of the drift velocity. However, now you could see that the charge Q is explicitly in the formula. Whereas when the force was an electric force QE, the charge is cancelled out. So let's look at an example of applying this general drift velocity formula. Charged particles subjected to a gravitational force in the presence of a magnetic field will undergo drift. So we replace the general force F with the gravitational force Mg which results in the gravitational drift velocity of Vg. So graphically we'll take the gravitational force as acting downwards and the magnetic field is into the page. What we find is that the two types of charges 
drift at right angles to both the gravitational and magnetic fields. However, the two charges now drift in opposite directions. Because their charge is explicitly in the drift velocity formula, Moreover, they drift at different velocities because their mass is explicitly in the formula. Let's now look at another example of drift, where the external force is now the centripetal force. The centripetal force arises due to curved motion. This is called curvature drift. In this example, the blue arrows represent a curved magnetic field, and the charged particle has a velocity parallel to the field. We assume its radius of curvature is RC. We now make use of the general drift velocity formula where we replace F with the expression for centripetal force. So if you recall the formula for centripetal force, it's mv squared on R. However, here you see that we have replaced F with mv squared R vector on R squared. This is required in order to make the centripetal force a vector quantity. It's also possible to get drift if there was nothing else other than a magnetic field. In this case, the magnetic field has to be non-uniform. The drift is referred to as grad B drift. Consider a magnetic field out of the page and non-uniform. As you can see, the magnetic field becomes stronger as you move up the page. This results in a magnetic field gradient, grad B. It's possible to show that a force arises out of a magnetic field gradient on a charged particle. We'll show something similar in the next lecture. We need to replace the force in the drift velocity formula by the expression for the force arising from a magnetic field gradient, given by this, where V perp is the speed of the particle at right angles to the field, and RL is the Larmor radius. Let's apply these ideas of drifts to some real-world situations. We'll pick on a device known as a tokamak. This is a toroidal plasma confinement device where magnetic field coils are used to contain a plasma. The idea is that once the plasma is contained and can be heated usually by a number of heating mechanisms, then it will reach a temperature where nuclear fusion will occur at a level where net energy gain is produced. This research has reached quite a mature stage where they can achieve break even in energy. That is, the heating energy in is equal to the fusion energy out. Further research is being undertaken to produce an energy gain device. For our purposes, we need to look at whether drifts occur inside the device. Let's look at a cross section of the plasma. Note how the magnetic fields follow the toroidal shape. The problem that arises when you make a toroidal magnetic field is that the magnetic field strength closer to the center of the donut is stronger than the magnetic field on the outer edge of the donut. This is a magnetic field gradient which leads to grad B drift of the particles. As you can see on the right hand side of the diagram the positive and negative particles undergo grad B drift to the top and bottom of the reactor. That is not good news for fusion because if you lose particles to the reactor walls then you could lose energy. The problem that compounds the grad B drift is once the particles move to the top and bottom of the reactor they establish an electric field. So now you have an electric field at right angles to a magnetic field causing E cross B drift which causes the particles to be flung outwards. Again, you can lose energy this way. To make matters worse, there is also curvature drift on the charged particles as well as gravitational drift. Tokamak physicists have learned to overcome these problems, but we will not discuss this here.